morning. This is the Evan Ginsberg Show at VillageConnectionRadio.com. Jim Savali, our engineer and owner at the helm. And today we are going to take an international tour with content from around the world. We have jazz great Karsten Ratka all the way from Germany and legendary musician David Shear from L.A. Uh, we have wrestling journalist Jim Phillips, 3,000 miles in from Denver. And uh, the world premiere video, Cause of You, or Cause of You, <laughs> St Stephanie Angelini featuring Brandon Watts. That's all the way from Australia, a world nice. premiere video we're going to play later. And right now we have promos from China's Middle Kingdom Wrestling and Steve the Teacher, who is a legit licensed teacher and pro wrestler. So... Uh, all the way from China, these two wrestling promos. wrestling promotion called Middle Kingdom Wrestling, MKW. And as the good teacher that I am, I studied and researched this group. And I discovered that this federation is full of nothing but uneducated, untalented trash talkers. They are in need of some serious education. And Steve, the ESL teacher, is the perfect man for the job. So September 7th in Harbin, China, Steve, the teacher, will be in attendance doling out his special lesson, a lesson in pain. Class dismissed. That was good. All right, that's my buddy Steve, the teacher, a, a legit ESL teacher, much like myself. <laughs> and uh, speaking of teaching, we have Jim Phillips, who educates the wrestling fans with his great historic um, content on the gorilla position. Thank you, sir. Uh, Pleasure to be Jim, here again. Jim Phillips, 3,000 miles from Denver for another New York sojourn. Uh, I love taking the trips. The road trips are where it's at for me, you know? So uh, tell me about Ignite Wrestling because I have no idea who that is. This is a promotion from Vero Beach, Florida. I just got picked up by their magazine. I'm working with them now. So it comes out about, I think it's every two months the magazine publishes. Um, Aaron Epic is their champion. Casey Lennox, she works for uh, MLW as the backstage correspondent. She's the ladies champion. It's a, you know, I mean, one of the better indie promotions out there. They've got a great website, content on Roku. Yeah, I like them a lot. They're good. I'm happy to be affiliated. And whenever I see Florida in the media, it's some like crazy, <laughs> like a woman has an alligator in her drawers or, you know, some, so, so <laughs> if the wrestlers are the most normal people in Florida, that's saying something. Yeah, well, that could be, <laughs> yeah. that's given, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every time I every time I see some insane story, I go, it's either Florida or Texas. Texas, yeah. Right? yeah it why seems why to be is that this? Way. The heat? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe so. Maybe there's something with that latitude line or longitude line that runs across there. Who knows? Well, now yeah, that pissed off uh, all the Florida viewers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you were with us yesterday at Alpha Championship Wrestling, the first show, packed. Yeah. No exaggeration. Yeah, it was, packed. Yeah. Standing room only. Yep. 
They didn't. They didn't have enough chairs to accommodate everybody. Now the space was tight, but it was seeing all those people there, and it was a hot crowd. I. It was enjoyable. So tell us, as a jaded old school fan, what was your take on Alpha Championship Wrestling? Well, the 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 work that the guys are putting in. There's some young guys there. They're trying to cultivate, which is great. That's a good thing. Um, I really enjoyed the match that um, Fabio Lus and Bobby C did. There was a lot more old school techniques in there. You could see. Team they Splendid. Was, they, yes, Team Splendid. They were telling the story. It wasn't just going out there and hitting bumps and spots. And, so did Team Splendid, myself included, as the uh, chauffeur, do, did we cross any lines <laughs> in humiliating the fans at ringside? I found it thoroughly enjoyable. I was one of the few people standing up cheering as you all came in. There, no one was happy to see you except for me, I don't think. <laughs> so there was a uh, there was a fan seated first row uh, with a uh, ch- with a replica belt, st- you know, flung across his shoulder. So this is like being first row at a comedy show. You know you're going to get picked on. It's that's so. a requirement for any indie show. There's always going to be the one guy with the belt that that yeah that wants to carry it around and have everybody take pictures. So I so I'm in the ring and I go to the guy. What's up with the belt? I go I go. What kind of champion are you? <laughs> and I go. And did mommy make you a pot roast for dinner tonight? <laughs> you know. So then if you think that's bad. Um, Chris Michaels comes out and he he rips on the guy. He goes, "You're a 45 year old virgin." It's, it was it so, was brutal. It's so funny though. It was such a great heel moment. I was yes. But, but my question is: Is there a line, you know, where it goes from playing heel to being cruel? Is there a line? Because I'll tell you a story. I was I was working with Team Splendid a couple months ago, and somebody pointed out a fan who had some mental issues and. And, and he pointed out a real physical floor. And I just said to the guy, no, 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 I don't want to go there. Yeah, there was a woman, and I, I just didn't want to go there. Well, there's, I hate to say good taste, because if you're a heel, there's no such thing. But there's a certain point, you know what I mean? I, I can't get enough of Ted DiBiase kicking the basketball out of the little kid's hand yeah. when he's dribbling it. But you don't want to kick somebody's cane out from under him, neither. There's a, you have to use a little bit of personal judgment. But I would say, if just like you said about the comedy show, if you show up, to an indie wrestling show, especially if you got a belt over your shoulder, you know what I mean, and you're obviously in no wrestling shape whatsoever to be out there. You Some should of the expect it. Wrestling fans aren't human sized at, should, at indie wrestling. You shows. should expect it. You know what I mean? It should be something in the back of your mind. You should be like, yeah, I'm probably going to get some heat. <laughs> yeah, we we like using words like peons and plebeians and uh, gutter snipes because the wrestling fans don't know what it means. <laughs> so, so anyway. This is about you. Tell us what's happening at the gorilla position and what are you working on? Everything's going really well. Um, I'm just rolled out. Should be out today, as a matter of fact. The going to heel, I've been talking about that for some time and was trying to wrap up the wrestling territories. Finally got the last territory in, which will be out in book form in the next few months. But the going to heel is so great. It's uh, We look at everybody that with singles runs mostly. I try not to do the tag team. I want to highlight their singles careers. But guys that generally didn't go face at all, just the bad guys, because that's that's what I love so much. Oh, yeah, yeah. I love Koloff, the I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and give it away a little bit. Koloff is uh, the first one that I took a look at, and there's I've got like 35 or 36. It seems like the list grows all the time, and something snaps in your head, and, oh, yeah, we've got to add that guy to the list. Hmm. But, yeah, I, I enjoy that a lot. Um. I found that many times great heels, when they turn face, it, it was a letdown. Yes. It was a letdown. For example, Don Morocco was a great heel, oh. one of the greatest. And as a face, he was just another guy in the card for the most part. Same thing with Ken Patera. Although they main evented, I mean, they lost something. Even the great Roddy Piper. You know, somebody was arguing with me online. I said, listen, he was not as good as a face. I mean, no, not it at just all. wasn't. I would say he was... 60 70 percent what he was and it was still great to see him because it was still roddy Piper. yeah he's still yeah but it it didn't have that same magic and um i the only guy i could think of that was just as great was pat patterson yeah pat patterson when he came out against slaughter with the street fights and patterson was, was great heel or face 
I can't think of too many guys like a that. A couple of times, the few times that Bockwinkle went over face in AWA, you know what I mean, trying to promote the brand a little bit, it's Bockwinkle. I could still watch okay. that. And I had no problem with, with him going that direction. But I saw Bockwinkle against Abisko live a couple of times uh, late in his career. He was still great. Bockwinkle yeah. was good all the way up yeah. to the end. A gentleman wrestler. Like, you you looked at that guy when he had the belt, and you you knew he was a champ. Even, you know I mean, he didn't even need the belt, really. And he just he had that aura about him. And he was an interesting promo because he spoke softly and yeah. intelligently. My late mom used to go, why do you all have to yell? Yeah. <laughs> so you got the Road Warrior and the Ultimate Warrior promo, stuff like that where they're screaming at you, telling you how they're going to take you apart. You got guys like Bockwinkle, Henning, Jake the Snake, guys that take the... Yeah, Jake take, Roberts was menacing. Take, yeah, take yeah. the tone down, slow it down, speak a little softer. Well, that's an old teacher you know? trick. We had Steve the Teacher on before. And I'm an educator, and Jim's wife's an educator. But uh, an old teaching trick is instead of yelling at the students, which would indicate you've lost control with kids, you speak lower, and, you know, and then all of a sudden they're, they're trying to hear you. Right. You know, this is not acceptable. You know, you yeah. sound menacing. <laughs> the kids, you know, so. Yeah, I can uh, see Jake the Snake walking in front of the classroom, telling them to calm down. That would be a promo to see. Tito Santana's a... <laughs> in New Jersey, nice. excuse me, a uh, Spanish teacher, Spanish language teacher, and um, I, could, I could see him controlling a class. He's a Arriba! Big, he's Sorry, a, I had to. He's a big, <laughs> a big guy, and uh, I, oh I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't see little. He, he teaches junior high, which is a tough, tough group. But I could see him controlling a class. That was uh, part of the story of his actual break in. I remember hearing that whenever he was speaking about it because of his natural size and height. Blanchard, Joe Blanchard, I think it was, he said, told him that, you know what I mean, you should be a wrestler. Plus, totally. he's always been a good-looking guy. So, yeah. you know, that doesn't hurt either. He's one of the rare guys who have always been a face. I don't think he was ever Steamboat. a hero. Steamboat. And, you know, it's funny. On the Internet, you see the same questions asked over and over and over ad nauseum. Has there ever been somebody who was only a heel, only a face? Who's the greatest tag team? It's like they, I they beat it to death. I can't. Whenever somebody asks me, it doesn't matter if it's about wrestling or not. Anything I'm avid movies, books, whatever. Somebody says, "Who's your favorite?" It's like there's. I'm sorry, I might be able to give you a top ten, but I'm not going to be able to narrow it down to one because there's always something about the someone else that I like just a little bit more than this guy. Or, then, then you have a this vague, who is the best? What does best mean? Yeah, you know, there's guys who sentimentally, like you know, if you. I would say Bruno in my heart, but there are guys, Holly Race could wrestle circles around them. You, you, yeah. you follow my logic? Exactly. So what does best mean? Well, Bruno was the best draw. He was champion for eight years. Hogan would come in three, four times a year. People seem to think Hogan was this huge draw. Bruno was there month after month after yeah. month for eight years drawing. So, uh, although they exaggerated his sellouts. Oh, every every show is sold out. That's absolute bull. I was there <laughs> many times. Him and George Steele. There's thousands of empty seats. Well, but he was still the champion for he, eight at years. At that point, yes, he's become a, the myth. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, and you got to perpetuate the nobody, myth. You nobody can't. ever slammed Andre. You know, until Hogan. Yeah. Nonsense. Harley Ray slammed them. Butcher Vashon yeah, slammed them. Yeah, look up them. some all, all Japan pro wrestling oh, when yeah. Andre was young. And yeah, a lot, plenty of guys slammed Andre. Yeah, he went. Yeah. Uh, so just. It's almost, you, you just perpetuate, you know, this fictional stuff, but uh, it works because people want to believe it. There's a t-shirt, Bruno, 2,000-something sellouts. Never happened. <laughs> Never happened. You're wearing a t-shirt with misinformation. Right. So, uh, before I forget, uh, Monty and the Pharaoh, Thursdays, 8.05, right here at Village Connection, our wrestling show. And um, we... Um, we support wrestling at uh, Village Connection. It's we, a good thing. The proletarian performance it's artist, a good thing. the late Fred Giobold used to say, my radio mentor, the proletarian <laughs> performance <laughs> art theater for the people. Yesterday was a weird vibe at this, uh, the place was called Catch in Astoria, Queens. It was like we were performing in front of like these Astoria hipsters who were like bemused by it all. It, but yeah, it was. Yeah. It felt like a. No, nah, I, I don't want go, gonna go so far as to say a frat house, but it was all yeah. that age group. You could tell that everybody was filtering in from yeah. from the bar that was connected. It was like but, guys in their twenties. It was a with hot their crowd, girlfriends, though. 
And it wasn't like a lot of guys with wrestling t-shirts or whatever. I heard a guy behind me, he, he's saying, I don't know what's going on, but I like this. Cause he just w never saw wrestling before. Yeah, there was, there was a lot of man buns in the crowd. We'll put yeah. it that way. <laughs> what, what's your take on man buns? Oh, my Lord. Yes. Any, all that stuff, skinny jeans, all that stuff. It's, I, I guess maybe it's how one generation doesn't like the one following them. I don't know, but I can't do Chris it. Chris Michaels uh, made a comment when he was on the mic about Astoria hipsters. So uh, he was healing on them. Uh, yeah, it was good. It was really good. And then the guy you were talking about earlier, the fan that had the belt, it was a funny instance. One of the matches was being announced. He was lumbering to his seat, and he had his beer because the guy lumbering's was, the word. He was, yeah, he wasn't a small guy, and like the hipsters behind me. Oh, there's the champion there. Oh, he's bringing his beer to the ring, and I'm, uh, yeah, I'm sitting yeah. here like this. You know what I mean? Next, yeah. yeah, it was, yeah. So I want you to know that um, I used a hundred year old joke yesterday, and it still <laughs> works. My father was born in 1920. Now in 2019, and he he used to use this line. They don't make heads like that anymore. <laughs> so I point to this guy, first row ringside, me and the manager, and I go, they don't make heads like that anymore. The guy looked like all red and uncomfortable. Right? No neck. Just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and my father used to have this line, who stole his neck? Yeah. I use that also. Yeah. But, uh, Oldie it, but a goodie. Huh? Yeah, yeah. They, <laughs> the, old, the old stuff works. But um, anyway, what are you watching lately? Wrestling wise, yeah, wrestling wise, I find myself going to YouTube a lot and looking up the old stuff. I'm uh, just subscribed to the New Japan website, so yeah. the New Japan World. I belong to New Japan. World. Yeah, I've just now come onto that. I was like using the, like I say, using YouTube and looking for specific matches, but with the website, you can go on and just see so much old classic stuff and just let it run. You know what I mean? It's yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. The uh, you talked about Middle Kingdom earlier. With the commercials, I'm doing an interview with one of the guys that works for them. Is wrestles under the Zombie Dragon, and he's been well, that's tagged. catchy. Zombie yeah. Dragon. Yeah, he's got a yeah, he's got a big headdress gimmick, and he does the Mist. Him and Tajiri have been tag teaming over oh, there, okay. doing the Green Mist gimmick. And for me, I don't know, it takes it back. It's the Kabuki and the Muda, and oh, yeah. whenever I see the Green Mist, it's like yes, yeah. I saw Muda against um, Sting live. It was tremendous. Yeah, Muda those, was those great. two. Muda was great. Yeah, those two were clicking. Yeah, I mean, by young that point, young Muda, young Muda. Yeah, as, yeah. as he got older, and the gimmick in Japan got got bigger, and the headdresses and everything got got more. I like to, to like Kabuki and Muda when they would come down with just a just a face mask, yeah, yeah. and then Kabuki especially and Gary Hart knew how to work it so well. He'd take the mask off and his hair was in his face, and then parted the hair, and then it was makeup yeah, yeah. and <sighs> shot the mist, and it was just such great theater. I watched the shoot interview with Gary Hart, and um, he was talking about the the making of Kabuki, you know, mm. molding him and because uh, you know he he wasn't a big guy and no you know, and. and he was he was he was a bald. He wasn't fat, in shape. Little but, guy, yeah. and they made him into like this killer, you know. So yeah. that that that's promoting. Gary and, Hart, and so great. Gary Hart was was amazing. I think he was one of the greatest managers of all time. Well, he had like the he had the ne'er do well, like the almost like the Kevin Sullivan had his army of darkness, like Gary Hart had like all the crazy guys. The but Gary the, Hart the bloodthirsty himself. the bloodthirsty guys. Oh yeah, Gary Hart himself. You go. This guy would stick a knife in you. <laughs> you know, that was the persona I'm he saying. He could turn it on. Yeah, that yeah, that yeah. he could give that face, you know what I mean? And you knew, yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you see like a little guy like the Grand Wizard and you're like, I could kick that guy's ass. But Gary Hart, you're like, I wouldn't mess with yeah, this you guy. Sure he looks he menacing. Had, you wasn't yeah. sure if he had a knife or a gun on him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gary yeah. Hart was uh, really top notch. It's too bad he didn't have like a big run in... WWWF or WWF because yep. I think he would have been huge. Oh man, Texas wrestling it was it was it was great to I see. I remember Humperdinck briefly came into WWWF or WWF and for whatever reason he didn't last. Right, he was managing Bigelow briefly. Yeah, and, I remember uh, that. Because Humperdinck was great, also. I, I grew up with him in the Hollywood Blondes, Jerry Brown and Buddy yep. Roberts. Yep. See, nowadays you have to distinguish the two because everybody thinks of Austin. You go. Buddy Roberts and Jerry Brown, yeah. the, the original Hollywood Blondes. Yeah, it's like Those the Blonde Bombers the same way, you know what I mean? You, you had Patterson and uh, Stevens. Stevens, and then uh, Ferris, they uh, Honky Tonk Man, Roy yeah. Wayne Ferris, they did a Blonde Bombers run down in uh, Smoky Mountain as well. Right, right, right. 
So, yeah, the the good names, people want to use them, you know. Back to Gary Hart, one of the greatest wrestling stories, one of my favorite, is well, it's it's a it's a bad story, but it tells the story of the man. The He was involved in that plane crash that was going over, I don't think they were in, I'm pretty sure they were down by Texas. They were going over a bay, and the plane went down, and Austin Idol and a few people were on the plane, oh, yeah. and Gary Hart got to shore, and he's cut up, he's gashed on his head, all messed up, Goes back out and hears these guys out there screaming and hollering. Swims back out three times. Wow. Not once, three times to go back and get his friends. Left his friends on the beach that were all tore up. And then goes and is like bloody, head to toe, half dressed, knocking on these people's houses to get help. You know what I mean? That's that's a man you want in your corner. That's a man you want as your friend. That's So the irony is he is one of the great villains who's a legit hero yeah a hero saving lives risking his own the guys that some of the best villains some of the best heels and i i haven't met a lot of them personally but i've been told through interviews some of the nicest people soft-spoken oh, yeah. kowalski oh yeah. i'm sure you can kowalski tell stories about that all day kowalski was actually shy he would sit on the couch opposite you, and unless you spoke first, he would just look at you. The guy was shy. So it was so ironic that he was one of the greatest heels. This, okay, I'm, I'm here for uh, therapy, not really for radio. I'm here for therapy. WWE had a top 50 list. Kowalski, I believe, was 49 <sighs> in the top 50, you know? Um, obviously, some kid wrote the list. Yeah. I mean, Kowalski, to me, was top 10 or 20 all-time easy great anything heel or face kowalski was on top for 30 years in in the 70s when he was wrapping it up he was still on top yeah okay so uh how do you have a list of the top 50 he was either 49 or 50 i forget he was it's at the an, bottom it's of the an, list yeah it's an insult the way the old the old stuff is forgotten which is one of the main things that drives me in trying to keep the history of the business alive you know, if they're if they're going to do these top ten lists, they need to break it down by a decade. You know, for real, because yeah. otherwise, it's the the guys that built the business that these kids are riding out now are getting forgotten. It's, yeah. it's please crazy. please don't tell me that the Miz is number seven yeah. and Kowalski's number fifty. Yeah, Come our, on, yeah. Come our on. truth in the twenty four seven title at number two. Yeah, oh. some craziness and flavor of the moment. My 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 other pet peeve. Um, we had this discussion in the car. I uh, I see these guys who will go from pay-per-view to pay-per-view to pay-per-view, spending thousands upon thousands of dollars. And then publicly, they'll say, I would never give a dime yeah. to one of these Kickstarters or GoFundMes because they're all a scam. And I'm like, you cheap bastard. Yeah. Vampiro, who's struggling to get through the day with Alzheimer's and is literally crying. It's heart wrenching. The guy's younger than me. He's got Alzheimer's. You can't dig into your pocket for five dollars, but you got four hundred twenty five dollars for a belt. A fake belt. To look like an idiot. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, I don't understand the I'm not an autograph seeker or a, a memorabilia hound. I'm not knocking the people who like that stuff, but I just never understood the need to walk around with the belt over your shoulder, let alone walk around with the belt over your shoulder to the event and sit there. But then after all the real wrestling has happened, you want to hop around in front of the ring and hold your belt up and have your buddy take a picture of you holding the belt up. You Look, know what I mean? Like, you, all, just, like it, you did something. It's harmless. If they get off on it, great. But don't publicly say that legitimate, legitimate, Kickstarters and GoFundMe's are all scams. Right. Come on. Because you, you, you're potentially hurting the guys who need it. Yeah. Well, guys like guys like Vampiro have given so much back to the business anyway. Look at all, I mean, not only the work they've done, but the, the people they've influenced, you know, and everything that's gone since they've started. Yeah. It's it's sad to see people act that way. Why don't we, why don't we take a brief time out and... Um, Jim could play out commercials and uh the wrestling fan, you know, 
they loved you or, or they hated you, you know, if, if the friend loved you, they couldn't do enough for you, you know, they, they want to buy your meal, they want to buy your drink. I, I think it was one of the main reasons that, you know, whenever I stepped into the ring, I, I wanted to give back, I wanted to satisfy their reason for coming out and watching me wrestle. I tell you what, I treated fans with respect and they loved me back. Whether I was a heel or a baby face, it didn't matter. I learned right from the get-go with my, my parents to, to appreciate every single fan that you got, every one. You know, I think that's one of the reasons I've had longevity in wrestling is that I always treated my fans with uh, a lot of respect. They wanted to kill me trying to get to my car, and they always knew I was in a Cadillac or something. And, and it was, uh, you know, they, yeah, you're, you were in fear for your life sometimes. The New Jersey crowds were always great in the Boston Garden. They were dangerous in the Boston Garden. The fans were, they were believers uh, in that era. They believed the doggone thing was real. And uh, they, they uh, were very, some of the fans were very violent. I look back on it and I'm saying, well, you put up a lot of you know what, but you know something, that's what drove me to do it. Because the more those people hated me, more of this I made. I was being punched and kicked, and I was having beer thrown on me. I was having, I was having, being hit by chairs. How angry do you want to make your wrestling fans? How much do you want to butcher up your baby faces until they're like they're all bleeding and they're being beaten by eight or ten guys? I mean, how far can you push an audience before they lose it and? And then you have the Alamo kind of thing. Play with people's heads, you know. You, you gotta play with their minds, you gotta play with them. Psychology. Because that's how you manipulate people. And that's what I do. That's what I did for a living. I manipulated you when you were a kid. I know I did. Because you didn't, probably didn't like me. Or you might have liked me because I was that way. And a lot of people did. A lot of people didn't. Thank you for the living I made at it, people. You were very good to me. All right, we are back with the Evan Ginsberg Show at VillageConnectionRadio.com. And earlier we uh, noted that Monty and the Faro Thursdays, 8 5 our wrestling show and they have some of the biggest names in the wrestling business and jim you have some business T plug whatever you want to plug right now in the gorilla position like i said earlier i've got the going to heal uh the ignite wrestling magazine comes out every i think it's every 60 days you can check that out ignitewrestling.com uh, john mcguire has got a uh, biography that just come out. I know John, if for those who don't know, John McGuire and Jimmy Hart wrote the majority of the wrestling themes in the 80s. Really good biography about his life with John Cosper. I've got the forward in that, so I'm happy about that. A lot of things are happening. Just got involved and started a YouTube channel called Urban Inc. We're going around and looking in uh, abandoned places and haunted houses, and I travel all over the country, so I'm working that into my schedule too, Do you know which is a lot are, of fun. There are homeless people living in the New York City subways. They're like, they're, that would be an interesting segment where you like go in go the down and look for and, the homeless people. Yeah, they're living. Oh, yeah. They're living in the. Oh tunnels. yeah, that'd be a good segment. Get hacked into pieces and carried ah, out in, in five different shopping carts yeah. across the city. Well, Couple of they're smart it's bottles. warm down there you know it's like <laughs> anyway. anyway but uh yeah we've been to the amityville whorehouse and i went to the limp mansion in st louis it was yeah it was good which mansion the limp mansion the limp the guy charles limp was the original beer L -I -M -P? magnate l-e-m-p l-e-m-p -E don't go there man Okay. It was the original, the original beer magnate in St. Louis before Budweiser and all that came along, and he built his brewery on top of these old Cherokee caves. And the Cherokees threw the, you know, what I mean, threw the mojo down on him for doing that. And like five people in his family committed suicide in that building, Ooh, wow. and you could feel it. They gave me full access to anywhere I wanted to go, and like it's as good, you went it's into good these, you lean towards the upbeat stories. Well, yes. it's it's haunted, yes. you know what I mean? Haunted yes. stuff and urban legends, you know. But the, it's enjoyable. People are into it. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Sure. And uh, any upcoming wrestling shows? Anything you're attending? 
Uh, I'm going to be going down to Brownsville, Texas next month to see a friend of mine. He used to be or, uh, affiliated high up with the NWA. We're going down there. I'm going to talk to him about a few things and work on a story that we got going. So, yeah, things are good. Okay. And uh, I just want to tell everybody to look out for SWF Wrestling. They run pretty much every weekend. And uh, any W Wrestling will be uh, coming back to Queens at the end of uh, September. So look for that as well with Team Splendid on the show. And uh, anything else you want to bring? You can't go wrong with Team Splendid. Those guys, they're always entertaining. I love watching them. It's like, it's like Don Rickles in the ring. The, uh, <laughs> scathing. It's Sc- great. Yeah, Thank it's, you. It's hard to beat a good heel team. Let right. alone a faction. And a uh, shout out to Naya Kennedy, who's. Um... Yep, yep. She was. Uh, she usually, whenever I come out, she's like my little tour guide. She lets me crash, all that stuff. It's great. So, yep, she's a good person. I love her a lot. All right. So, we want to thank you once again. 3,000 miles from Denver yep. to uh, Long Island. And. Uh, yeah, it's been a fun it's trip. Like home I've enjoyed away from it. Home. Yep. I try. I try to get out here a few times a year. I like it. You know what I mean? You got to. It's about, like I said earlier, it's about the journey. It's about the adventure. I don't, I'm not one of these people who wants to save up and buy the next big system, entertainment system that's coming out, or, oh, I want to get this new thing that's coming out. You can have all the material possessions in life and just replace all that stuff. No, that means anything. It's about your journey and, you know, me and the trip, you know, the adventures that you take. I tell people I'm happiest at a R&B show or an indie wrestling show. No, really. I'm just... You put me in, in an R&B show, you have every race, creed, color, age, Right. everybody's happy, everybody's enjoying the music, uh, you're in the moment, especially when it's great. I saw Bobby Rush the other day. Oh, nice. Tonight I'm going to see Santana, which isn't technically R&B, but Santana plays everything. Yeah, it's going to be a great show. And um, I do about 25 shows a, a summer, you know, um, and at an indie wrestling show, it's almost like my cheers. Everybody knows you. Everybody's <laughs> happy to see you. You have a cu- you literally have a couple of drinks. It was a bar yeah. yesterday. Well, it's like you see old friends that you might not have seen for a while. I Tom Burke, the historian, was and you yesterday. meet new friends. I could, yeah, that was a great John conversation. John Pantosi, one yeah. of the great historians and collectors. Yep, yeah. I got to see Papa Don. I haven't seen him in a long time. We've done stories together. Let me so. briefly say something about Papa Don. Um, Papa Don is as good as pretty much anybody who steps foot in a ring. I agree. And basically, the fact that he's not in WWE, WWE reeks of ageism. Yeah. Because they they like him in their 20s, and he's probably 40-ish at this point. Vordell Walker as well. We yeah. spoke about that. There's a lot of guys that, that are still on the indies, Damian Wayne Costell. They're still out there I doing mean, well, their thing. They should at least um, hire them, give them a contract, and... Uh, you know, squander them like they do the rest of the guys. Oh, yeah. Just give them a check and put them on main event. and uh, But give them a chance. I mean, these guys are great. They, I think they've more than earned it. They would be good in developmental, so great in places like that because they've lived the road. They've been out there. They know what it's like. They can give them the education about things that aren't in the ring to expect. You know what I mean? That life out there. It's not and, easy. And Papa Don's a total package. He has a great gimmick. He can talk. He, he can, can talk. wrestle. He can brawl. Total he sells. Package. Yeah. yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. Imagine that. Jim Phillips, the gorilla position. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for coming back on. Thank All you. All right. And we will be shifting to arts and music in just a few with meteor expert Erica A. And jazz and music. I don't even want to limit it to jazz because these guys play everything. Karsten Ratko all the way from Germany and David Shear from L.A. But right now, all the way from Australia, Cause of You, Stephanie Angelini featuring Brandon Watts, um, and uh, I want to thank Joe Mandica for setting this up. Thanks, man.
Okay, so the Evan Ginsberg Show is back. I'm Erica A., media expert, writer, edit, sometimes editor, often not a director, here to talk about media, trends, and expertise. What's coming up in the fall? What's on right now? What got canceled? What do we think? I think we're going to start with the fact that the MTV VMAs are back. going to be this weekend. It's going to air tomorrow, Monday. And it's sort of interesting. You look at the trends of who's a musician now and who's back who's not in. It's pretty much the same thing in my opinion. I'm not as big a fan of the music of today. I know Evan Ginsberg loves music. He's always going to concerts. But for me, right now I look at it and I'm like, it feels like the same thing as five years ago. I can't think of any of the songs that really stand out. But I am interested in Missy Misdemeanor Mina Elliott. She's winning the Video Vanguard Award today. Well, not today. Maybe tonight, but she's winning it when it airs tomorrow. <laughs> I hope it is going to be live, though, but it doesn't look that way. Because that's the secret of television, what they can edit out. Which, over the years, ever since the 80s, the best moments are the ones that aren't planned. So, I'm excited about that. I'm also excited about some shows on some of the premium channels. Like I was mentioning last time that I was very interested in a new show that was on Stars called Rook. It just finished, and the end was so worth the means. So if anyone watches Stars, you should definitely have gone back and check it out. Stars now is promoting Power, which is the 50 Cent show. So that premiered. So anyone who's a fan of that, you should definitely go and check it out. It's starting this weekend. 50 is a pretty good rapper, but something that he should be careful about is that when he was talking about promoting the new season, sometimes he got too excited and it's hard to understand him as he spoke. So I hope that he's working on that and I hope the show is going to be worth it because this is going to be its final season. HBO is up to its old tricks. It's been it seems to be slowing down in its production. I'm still waiting to find out what's going to happen on a few shows. I did like the Deadwood movie, so if anyone did see that, that premiered and went over the summer. Superheroes are seeming to be in prequel mode right now. Krypton just finished its season. It seems like sci-fi is going to do the axe on it again. Sci-fi has been doing that way too much, if anyone else has noticed. I mean, Deadly Class never got a chance. And now Krypton, with its terrible first season and pretty good second season, is now left on total cliffhanger. On the other hand, Pennyworth. If anyone watched that, now that is worth looking at. It's a superhero prequel to a prequel that has no superhero genre whatsoever. So... It's in England. It's sort of supposed to be post-World War II, but it also sometimes has a crazy feel, almost like it could be in the 1800s. So I'm interested in that. I've been watching it. I think you guys should also be excited about the fall season. One show out there that's interesting that I think will look promising is Evil, coming to CBS. So it's going to be a brand new show. It's a and the cast are a few unknowns, a few lesser characters, hopefully they don't die, are big names. And I went, wow, I haven't seen him work in quite a few years. So that'll be exciting. One thing, though, I'm very surprised about for the fall season, we don't have the rebooting craziness that has been going on for so long, where shows get revived or rebooted out of the blue. I guess after last year, between Murphy Brown and Roseanne, it's just a dying fad. I will be interested what happens, though, when we get to the January lineup, if there are shows in the works and they're just testing the water. Still angry at the CW that they have pretty much decided they're canceling all their old shows. So I'll be hopeful that they all end with a bang when they come back in September and October. Some of them aren't coming back. Over the summer, I've been enjoying The Outpost, which, as I told Evan, he should watch, but... Kevin is like, what is the outpost? And I'm like, it's a show that takes place at an outpost. The appropriately named <laughs> The Outpost. Thank you. And it has really picked up this season. So if you're looking for something that is not vampire or superhero related, it still has a nice supernaturally feel, almost like a Lord of the Rings kind of sensation to it. Definitely check it out. Uh, right now... Also, anime doesn't seem to be rocking it the same way it was. I've been disappointed in it. 
nothing really exciting there I can talk about. But on the other hand, Nickelodeon has been taking an interesting turn. I can't believe it. Looks like they're going to revive Are You Afraid of the Do Dark? Which I don't know if people remember it from back in the 90s. They've already went to Double Dare. They already redid Hey Arnold. They've done all that is back. Now they're going to do Are You Afraid of the Dark? So if they do, I'd be very interested with where it goes. But I'm not sure they should be tampering with things from the past that way might not translate as well into the present time because if you look back at Are You Afraid of the Dark? The effects weren't that great and so is it going to be all CGI'd now to make it look more cool and very millennial? So I'm a little concerned. As for the other networks, ABC seems to be going rather comedy. I haven't seen very much promoting of what their new shows will be. So I'd be curious. ABC, put your commercials out there more. And so right now, where else are we? Should we talk about Showtime? Should we talk about the streaming services? I know most people are into their streaming services. I've still got to catch up on that. I've been looking at Amazon, though. New show coming out that looks very interesting. So everyone, keep watching. And what else should we talk about? Should we? I think we should just call it a day here. <laughs> so... Keep watching. Remember to check everything out. Remember to keep track of what's on. And remember, don't just start complaining about it online. Be part of it. Appreciate entertainment. Entertainment music. Entertainment improv. There's so much out there. And keep watching. There you go, Erica. Hey, <laughs> all right. And when we come back, Cost and Rat go all the way from Germany and David Shear from LA, legendary musicians live performing in studio. The wrestling fan, you know, they loved you or, or they hated you. You know, if, if the fan loved you, they couldn't do enough for you. You know, they, they want to buy your meal, they want to buy your drink. I, I think it was one of the main reasons that you know, whenever I stepped into the ring, I, I wanted to give back. I wanted to satisfy their reason for coming out and watching me wrestle. I tell you what, I treated fans with respect and they loved me back. Whether I was a heel or a baby face, it didn't matter. I learned right from the get-go with my, my parents to, to appreciate every single fan that you got, every one. You know, I think that's one of the reasons I've had longevity in wrestling is that I always treated my fans with uh, a lot of respect. They wanted to kill me trying to get to my car and they always knew I was in a Cadillac or something and and it was uh, you know they, yeah you're you were in fear for your life sometimes the New Jersey crowds were always great in the Boston Garden they were dangerous in the Boston Garden the fans were they were believers uh, in that era they believed the doggone thing was real and uh, they they uh, were very some of the fans were very violent I look back on it and I'm saying well, you put up a lot of you-know-what, but you know something? That's what drove me to do it. Because the more those people hated me, the more of this I made. I was being punched and kicked, and I was having beer thrown on me. I was having, I was having, being hit by chairs. How angry do you want to make your wrestling fans? How much do you want to butcher up your baby faces until they're, like, they're all bleeding and they're being beaten by eight or ten guys? I mean, how far can you push an audience before they lose it and then you have the Alamo kind of thing? Play with people's heads, you know. You, you got to play with their minds. You got to play with them. Psychology. Because that's how you manipulate people. And that's what I do. That's what I did for a living. I manipulated you when you were a kid. I know I did, but you didn't, probably didn't like me, or you might have liked me, because I was that way. And a lot of people did. A lot of people didn't. Thank you for the living I made at it, people. You were very good to me. Say, you're Bobby Rivers, right? Bobby barely registers and nods while he looks around for women. I love how you beat Billy Dean tonight. I hate that guy. You know, I can't Bobby looks at the bar and sees Willie Dean here. talking to two girls. Hey, Chris, kayfabe. He looks at the fan, 
to our man. We stay here. There's going to be a fight. You know what I mean? Let's go, Chris. Chris asks, why didn't we stay? There wasn't going to be any fight. Listen, brother. Bert Ironside's rule number one. Baby faces and heels do not socialize. Why? It's all about protecting the business. You don't tell your five-year-old that there's no Santa Claus and faces and heels do not sit in a bar full of marks drinking together. Kings of the Ring is the first audio drama podcast based on wrestling. Search Kings of the Ring from any podcast app or kingsotr.com. Ladies and gentlemen, it's KMB, the Sexy Ninja, and I just saw a beautiful, beautiful documentary. I cannot stress anymore how much I love this so much. It's been out for a while. I've been trying to get to it, trying to get to it, but it's work, 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 baby. That's all it is, but I finally sat down, took some time out of my day and out of my schedule to watch... Three hundred and fifty days. Legends, champions, survivors. Okay, off the back, I'm gonna say the director's name, and I'm hoping I get it right. Fulvio Ciciri. I hope I said that right. Directed uh, this amazing movie. Amazing. Um, uh, this, I can't stress how good this fucking is. Like, this is everything. Like, if you are a fan of old school wrestling, and these are the guys I've always wanted to sit down and have a beer with. Or even some shots or alcohol. You you got Brett the Hitman Hart, Ted DiBiase, Greg the Hammer Valentine, Superstar Billy Graham. I mean, the list is incredible. Like, it, oh, like you know, like I said, Abdullah the Butcher and Brett, yeah, all these guys, man, Jimmy Snuka, like all right there on the cover. I mean, this is really good. And all their stories, they 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 go and take. They're like, yeah, fuck, man. We, I, you know, shit, I did steroids. How do you think I kept this body? And, you know, oh, shit, we were drinking till 6 in the morning and sleep and hit the road by 8. You know, I was just like, yes, this is the stories I love, man. And, you know, it's very, and they're, everyone's honest and talking about the days because back in the day, that's what it was. You, they worked 350 days out of the year. 350 days out of the year. Think about that. And, you know, and Ric Flair talks about it all the time. And I really wish, you know, because I know WWE, uh, a lot of wrestlers were tied up in um, WWE, you know, Legends contracts. So they couldn't be on this. But I wish they could. I wish I wish WWE would just be like, you know, go go do this. Do this movie. Because that would have been like the full front. But this alone, though, it's beautiful. It's, it's just so amazing. And the way I heard about this movie, uh, of course, um, Instagram and stuff was like, oh, 350 days. Then, um... Uh, God, Fulvio was on the Talk is Jericho podcast talking about the movie, and he says there's so much footage he shot and this and that, sitting down with everybody, hearing everybody's story. I was so jealous because I was like, damn, this is, oh, uh, and it's, that's an amazing podcast too. You should check that out. It's on uh, Talk is Jericho. I believe he still has it up, unless you're signed up to the Stitcher. I don't know. You know those crazy premiums where the episode kind of disappears and you have to go by the back. I don't know. It's a great episode. It's a really, really good episode. And the movie itself is really fucking good and well played out. Um, I love documentaries, especially ro- wrestling ones. I love them so much. Like, And this one is at the top of my list. I'm probably going to watch this again because I enjoyed everybody's stories. You should check it out also. It's on Amazon. Uh, I believe they have a website, 350days.com. Check it out, man. It's it's fucking amazing. And Falvio, I salute you, sir, to all the wrestlers, to all the legends that were on this. Oh, so fucking good. Get your copy today. If you are a hardcore wrestling fan, you need this in your life. Um, I will try to have the link to the Amazon um, below in the comments so you can go get your copy. This is fucking magic. 
fucking magic. You should get it. Whoop, whoop. Oh, like and subscribe also. All right, we are back with the Evan Ginsberg Show at VillageConnectionRadio.com. Joining us once somewhat summer residency every year, Karsten Ratko, all the way from Germany, and David Shear from L.A., two great, great artists performing live in studio. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs>
love how you beat Willie Dean tonight. I hate that guy. You know, I can't Bobby looks at the bar and sees Willie Dean talking to two girls. Hey, Chris. Kayfabe. He looks at the fan. Sorry, man. We stay here. There's going to be a fight. You know what I mean? Let's go, Chris. Chris asks, why didn't we stay? There wasn't going to be any fight. Listen, brother. Bert Ironside's rule number one. Baby faces and heels do not socialize. Why? It's all about protecting the business. You don't tell your five-year-old that there's no Santa Claus and faces and heels do not sit in a bar full of marks drinking together. Kings of the Ring is the first audio drama podcast based on wrestling. Search Kings of the Ring from any podcast app or kingsotr.com. All right, we are back with the Evan Ginsberg Show, joined by Costin Ratger and David Shear, and what a great set. And I listed you guys as, quote, jazz greats, but you, you guys play everything. What, what, how would you like to label yourselves? <laughs> <laughs> Contemporary musicians? Contemporary musicians. Yeah. That, that's pretty wide. Yeah. That, 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 that's fitting. That's fitting. So I was reading your bio, and tell, tell us about the Ernie Fields Orchestra. Oh, <laughs> that was a musical experience and a sociological one. It was the only white person in a black band. Tell us about that. And um, six years after the Supreme Court declared segregation unconstitutional, the places we played didn't know it. We, um, in some instance, in one instance in particular, had to travel 80 miles to another town because the empty hotel in the town where we were playing wouldn't rent to us. Wow. And um, although there was never any kind of, I never felt in any physical danger, we were reminded day in and day out that black people were second class citizens we're, you're not allowed here. You can't go in there. We have a back door for you people. Mm. That kind of thing. And um, obviously, I could have walked away at any point. But these were my friends. It was my job. And um, did you ever consider writing a book about this? It's a well, unique it's, perspective. It's on my uh, website. The pretty much the story of that. Uh, mm. Can I tell you what that Bel Air Jazz dot org? Sure, sure. Plug anything you want to plug. And, uh, 
Uh, well, there's some CDs there too. Uh, thank you. <laughs> okay. But it was it was an interesting experience uh, you know, from the first days of the last. Wow. What was the most troubling thing that you experienced? Is a particular incident that stands out? Well, yeah, it's it it was the same the same day we stayed eighty miles away from the town where we were working. And we got up the next morning. It was way too early to go to work, so Ernie called a rehearsal. We finished the rehearsal, and my roommate, who's a drummer named Billy Davenport, who is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a member of the Butterfield Blues mm. Band. Wow, oh, okay. It's my roommate. We went That's downstairs fight, below the rehearsal hall, and there was a store, package store, whatever you call it. He went over, took a bottle of pop out of the chest, put it on the counter, put the money down, and as the guy handed him his change, he said, we had a back door for you people. Mm. Well, Billy was from Chicago and wasn't used to that. We got on the bus and he was, he was incredulous and people were trying to calm him down. Right. We drive the 80 miles to the town where we're working and it's pouring rain and we pull up in front of the club and my other roommate, saxophone player named John Cameron, who I was a teenager, he was about my father's age, he, he uh, stood in front of my seat and he just stood there with a funny look on his face for a long time and I finally started to laugh and I said, what? And he said, you know, the minute you get off this bus, you're gonna be soaked. And I said, yeah. He said, through to the skin, yeah. He said, you see that store across the street? Yeah, I need a package of cigarettes. If I carry your instruments into the hall, will you go and get me a package of cigarettes? I could drown looking for the back door in this weather. Mm. Wow. Well, there was a guy who was in his 40s. He was used to that system. Mm. You know, some... Uh, and, what, and what people tend to forget is this is not that long ago, 50, 60 mm -hmm. years back. I mm -hmm. mean... 59 years ago. That yeah. Was with that yeah. Band. yeah. So... Uh, it's been a lot of progress, and still there needs to be a lot of progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, well, there are forces of evil still trying to drag us back to those, mm -hmm. those days. Exactly. <laughs> Without getting into any deep political. <laughs> As a performer, <laughs> I often I often see um, on both sides. You know, you'll have a name performer get on a stage in front of thousands of people, and they're pro-Trump or anti-Trump. And half the audience is going to turn on them. So as a performer, what's your take on bringing politics into a performance arena? Uh, I, I, I don't know why there is resistance to a prominent person in, in, in a, an art commenting on political situation. Some, but whatever the other side is, they don't think he should do it. Right, right, right. right. Mm. Yeah. Um, I don't, I wouldn't know how to do that, well. except to lead an exemplary life and oppose Trump. <laughs> there you go. I think uh, it's not really necessary. You would put ourselves into a position just through the music that we're playing. Well, I'll give you an example. Barbara Streisand was playing uh, The Garden, I believe, and you know, she's very political and you know, some of the audience agreed and some of the audience was upset. Mm -hmm. Like, we're here to hear music, we're not here to hear politics. Mm -hmm. And it's done on the other side as well. Mm -hmm. So m my real question is, mm -hmm. is it worth alienating half your audience? Mm -hmm. You know, because you could do it on social media. You don't have to do it at the mm -hmm. show. I can, do, I can do it by playing the saxophone. Right, 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 right. I think the audience... No, I mean the, alienate the audience, half right. the audience. Right, I think the audience that we have um, knows where it stands. Sure, <laughs> sure, sure, absolutely. So we don't have to big divide that Barbara right. Streisand would have with the garden, you know. Yeah. I've mm. never felt that, that, I've always felt strongly about it, but never this strongly. Mm. I think our way of life is threatened. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. On a happier note, tell us about some career highlights. You've been out there for a long time, David. Um, this is freelance studio musician. Um, every uh, every job was a new experience. I mean, you know, you, it's freelance. You don't work with the same people twice, ex except by coincidence. The music is always different. Tell us about some of the giants you've worked with. Interesting. 
Well, I played on a Freddie Hubbard record. Oh, there you uh, go. Didn't didn't get to meet him. Um, I played in a hundred piece orchestra accompanying Frank Sinatra. As uh, a musician, when you're in a hundred piece orchestra, do you hear the one guy that's playing off? <laughs> can, can, oh, yes. <laughs> well, in that case, nobody was. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. It was a high paid group. All right. Oh. Oh, there were, I sat next to some of the greatest musicians in the world and some people that were there because their brother-in-law was the guy hiring the musicians. Wow. So. And, and tell us about some of the legends that you have worked with. God, legends. Well, Stravinsky, sort of. He was supposed to conduct, but he sent a sub. He sent he, a sub? Yeah, he came, okay. he came to the concert, but he... <laughs> Uh, is there is there additional pressure when you're playing in front of somebody like Stravinsky? It, oh well, it's always pressure. You, you got You usually get one chance to do it right. Mm -hmm. In that case, the conductor was a real impediment, but we got through it. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. And how did you gentlemen meet? That happened in two thousand one at this uh, artist in residence program, where um, they put together like fifteen people from all over the world. Miss, wow. make them mismatch, you know, like not forming a group that is kind of coherent, but that is provoking each other to do things that they wouldn't have done otherwise. So I think it was both of us who applied with the barrier sequenzas. And uh, it was the time, you know, when obviously this was the right thing to do. So we met each other and it was very interesting because we had this really diverse group also age-wise. There was a young bass player Travis de Ruzza who was playing with us and I, I remember that picture that was taken of the three of us we were playing trio and I thought it's like this three generation kind of making music it was beautiful wow. a very unique experience for I think all of us and we became not only dear friends but he's like a mentor to me wow. <laughs> not only that's, musically that's a lot of response no oh, I don't great. have any response that's don't have great to. this reminds me of a documentary <laughs> I highly recommend it's called Take Me to the River where you have very old blues players. Um, mm -hmm. Otis Clay, for example, who recently passed, he was 78 at the time, and they're playing with young rappers. And you would mm -hmm. never think this would oh, work, yeah, but it, it, it works. Oh, yeah. And it's a tremendous film, and it's, it's very moving in spots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's just this... Yeah, Somehow they put they they put it all together, you know. You have like a twelve year old kid with an eighty year old blues player, and it's mm. beautiful, mm. beautiful. Yeah, you can make me things match. Last night we met Joel Thome, our dear friend. He was Frank Zappa's conductor for the, the uh, orchestra of our time. And he played some music for us, and uh, Zappa was also in, into mu new music, so he would love um, Edgar Varese, and he played this one uh, recording for us, which is just unique. He wants to try to put it out and doesn't know how to do it because, yeah. But it was in the Palladium in 1981. It was just the most amazing thing I've ever heard, not only recording-wise, but the music was played just, just good. And the, the crowd was not like the new music crowd. It was right. like Frank Zappa's cl 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 yeah, yeah. crowd. And he had to just calm them down. You have to be quiet now. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> in, in 2019, could a Zapper or Captain Beefheart or Sun Ra, could they find their audience or? Oh, I think more now than ever. Why, why do you say that? I, I don't know, it's just that, it, it, well, Zappa was gonna make it in any case, but Sun Ra, that was a real niche kind mm -hmm. of thing. I wonder how many people in the world, tiny percentage even heard of him then. Mm -hmm. now I think he's more well known now well, after oh, his yeah. death. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Some of the best nights of my life was seeing. I, I once took a date to see Sun Ra on New Year's Eve. She was befuddled, <laughs> and we never went out again. Uh, but uh, Sun Ra was amazing. I took a um, recent Russian immigrant oboe player to hear a rehearsal I did with Frank Zappa, and he said, "I don't know what's going on." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that was that uh, con that 1975 we determined Zappa album double album done at Royce Hall. Well, speaking of that, yeah, since you brought time. that up, oh, that's a long time. I have I have all these glowing reviews for your CDs, and uh, extremely innovative. In a world where there is so much that is negative, how vibrant is the rediscovery <laughs> of man's ability to be creative, original, and daring? But you mixed in 
two negative reviews with like 40 glowing reviews. Those, and those are the Why? only two, those Why? are the only two negative reviews. But what motivated you to do that? That's I the just, question. I just I just figured that um, putting a review in there that questions the musicianship directly below one by Lalo Schifrin says that, that says the musicianship is extraordinary. Right. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe I'd put that critic out of business. That, that's interesting <laughs> because I was just I was just online and um, I pulled up Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, which some consider you know one of the greatest albums ever made. And there's 550 thumbs down. Uh -huh. So I'm like, are they tone deaf? Is it the KKK? Who's giving that thumbs down? You know? My first job with Ernie Fields, the, the first day of the second week, we backed up Marvin Gaye. Wow. Yeah, in Muskegon, Michigan. And what was that experience like? Um, nobody knew him at that point, 1960. The only thing I remember from that experience is... Um, his conductor was a flute player, so we had to talk about flutes. Um, we had done a week at the Regal Theater in Chicago, and the next job was in Muskegon, Michigan, for three days with um, Marvin Gaye. Harry James's band was in the same hotel. His first alto player was the only black guy in his band, and I was the only white person in Ernie's band, and his alto player was famous. I saw him walking down the hall, but I didn't have the nerve to talk to him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Willie Smith, great alto player. Wow. So you you guys have played with some of the masters, and uh, <laughs> what do you have for the, what do you have going on in the future? Looking ahead, we're improvising. Also, with the future, things come up like Evan's show; <laughs> they just <laughs> pop up, and then we go. Yeah. I'm just practicing long tones and yeah, and I'm scales. practicing. I'm practicing counting on two and three, so we're basically the same. I, I remember reading um, Sonny Rollins, who many considered the greatest saxophone player. He said uh, he's in his 80s. He's practicing two hours a day. Oh yeah. So um, you know, it, uh, it's oh, and it's it, admirable. Um, you know, that, that guys are still that driven. Because uh, Sonny Rollins has nothing to prove at that point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess if you don't get it now, you're not going <laughs> to. So tell, tell us about your CDs and your label and anything you want to plug. Um, they are another way of combining jazz and classical music. I play a classical piece and then use the elements of that in a composition, a so-called companion piece. And um, well, there are three of them, and I think they're good records. The second one is, um, shouldn't say it, my favorite of the three, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, everything just came so together. So there's no like middle child syndrome. The second's the best mm -hmm. one. Oh, right. yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, everything just came together. The third one, I think, I, I was a little bit too long, maybe. Okay. But now you can download it. You don't have to download the, the <laughs> second CD. I find mm -hmm. sometimes with musicians, they're almost too self-critical, and somebody else will, you know, say this is perfect, but... Uh, I've never heard of anything that I thought was perfect. I mean, that I did. Okay. But That's because you're humble. No, <laughs> it's... It, there's always something to improve, but that record really came together. There you go. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and tell people where they could get it. Oh, belairjazz.org has links. And, and spell it. Spell B E L. A I R J A Z Z dot O R G has links to where you can get it. The musicians on those CDs were just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. You know, live in Los Angeles, there's a lot of great musicians. Sure, sure. And cost and anything you want to plug, promote, upcoming? Uh, mm, well, I'll go back to Germany next week and then we'll play over there. I have a trio um, that I've played with a couple of years ago. It will be all improvised and then uh, do some solo stuff and then uh, this really wonderful um, tabla player from India from Kolkata will come over and we'll do some Indian stuff uh, combined with free improv. And, and Kostam, what does it mean for you to play with somebody as great as David? As I just said, I, know, uh, I feel he is like a mentor. I always listen when he has to say something. You can just throw something in and he comes up with all these stories and it's a good reason to just open your eyes wide open and then um, for me it's an honor to be with somebody like like David there you go not only musically <laughs> I don't think we could end on a happier note than that yeah <laughs> so uh, when we come back we're gonna have another live set and this is the eclectic mix known as the Evan Ginsberg show where uh, 
today today alone we mixed wrestling and film and TV and now this great live music. So uh, we're honored to have you gentlemen on. And, uh, Thank you. We'll be back with a live set in just a bit, folks. The wrestling fan, you know, they loved you or, or they hated you. You know, if, if the fan loved you, they couldn't do enough for you. You know, they, they want to buy your meal. They want to buy your drink. I, I think it was one of the main reasons that, you know, whenever I stepped into the ring, I, I wanted to give back. I wanted to satisfy their reason for coming out and watching me wrestle. I tell you what, I treated fans with respect and they loved me back. Whether I was a heel or a baby face, it didn't matter. I learned right from the get-go with my, my parents that it was to, to appreciate every single fan that you got, every one. You know, I think that's one of the reasons I've had longevity in wrestling is that I always treated my fans with uh, a lot of respect. They wanted to kill me trying to get to my car, and they always knew I was in a Cadillac or something. And, and it was, uh, you know, they, yeah, you're, you were in fear for your life sometimes. The New Jersey crowds were always great in the Boston Garden. They were dangerous in the Boston Garden. The fans were, they were believers uh, in that era. They believed the doggone thing was real. And uh, they, they uh, were very, some of the fans were very violent. I look back on it and I'm saying, well, you put up a lot of you know what, but you know something, that's what drove me to do it. Because the more those people hated me, more this I made. I was being punched and kicked, and I was having beer thrown on me. I was having, I was having, being hit by chairs. How angry do you want to make your wrestling fans? How much do you want to butcher up your baby faces until they're, like, they're all bleeding and they're being beaten by eight or ten guys? I mean, how far can you push an audience before they lose it and? Then you have the Alamo kind of thing. Play with people's heads, you know. You, you gotta play with their minds, you gotta play with them. Psychology. Because that's how you manipulate people. And that's what I do. That's what I did for a living. I manipulated you when you were a kid. I know I did. But you didn't probably didn't like me, or you might have liked me, because I was that way. And a lot of people did. A lot of people didn't. Thank you for the living I made at it, people. You were very good to me.
So that'll about do it, folks, for the Evan Ginsberg Show. Costin Ratka, David Shear. Thank you so much, gentlemen. And, um, of course. And um, we just want to tell you, as always, support indie everything. Indie music, indie film, indie theater, indie wrestling, indie everything. Indie radio. Indie radio. That's right, indie radio. Jim, anything you want to plug? What's happening at the station? The station is doing great, bro. I mean, you've been here two years now? Yeah. I mean, you've seen the growth. I mean, you were one of the first shows we had. Yeah. Um, and it really is taking off, and we have some new shows coming out in Yeah, September. plug them, plug them. Um, I'm not sure what the names are yet because they're just starting, but we have about three or four new shows coming out. And uh, the ones who are on, I mean, uh, I'm really thankful to have them all. They really uh, have built the station, you know. It's kind of uh, amazing because it's something that really doesn't exist it's not a very common thing what we're doing so we're kind of setting standards and it's kind of cool i like it yeah it's um it's kind of like back in the 60s and 70s yeah. when radio would play everything and we have right wing shows we have left wing shows we have <laughs> you know a little of uh everything and uh i think thankfully um, the the political stuff calmed down <laughs> we got rid of some of the shows that were doing it and it's all it's all friendly that's the but that's the greatest thing is most of everyone involved is so different we have music shows we have business shows wrestling shows two plumbers talking nonsense shit <laughs> and all of these things for the most part we all get along and we have people coming in from germany and it's just it's kind of amazing to me. I never expected it to uh, to become what it is. Yeah. On this show alone, we had a uh, world uh, video premiere from Australia. Yeah. Stephanie Angelini and Brandon Watts. Um, what would we have? Like forty wrestlers here, plus your shows. Fifty wrestlers here, <laughs> probably at least. Wrestle, wrestlers wrestlers uh, and stand up comics are good talkers. <laughs> stand up comics, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And uh, musicians, I love musicians, as you know, that's how I started. We started Village Connection Radio. We were not video at first. It kind of just progressed naturally into this when Facebook added the ability to go live. Um, and it kind of grew from there. So it's kind of neat. You know, we support local music. We support foreign music. <laughs> I mean, you can't get any better than that, right? That's right. That's right. So on that happy note, we just want to thank everybody. This is the Evan Ginsberg Show at Village Connection Radio for Jim Savali. We are signing off. Thank you. Oh, my mind clears. Oh, I share.